In the message, our churches were a little different than other Christian churches. Other churches talked about the Bible like we did, but message pastors focused on what the prophet said about the Bible. Some pastors had known the prophet personally and had many stories to tell. Others had studied the sermons of the prophet and knew his words and those sermons intimately. The prophet often spoke about himself, his life, and his history. When he did, they were often paralleling stories in the Bible, but not parallels that the general public would know or understand. Growing up as children in the message, these stories held us captivated. When our parents played stories of the way that he trapped and fished and hunted in the Kentucky wilderness, it was like listening to stories about the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In fact, most of us preferred those stories over reading Mark Twain. The adventures of the prophet enriched our lives. As children, they were our favorite part of the sermon. One story that I remember as a child was often repeated in our church. The prophet told how his mother would pour coon grease into the eyes of his seven brothers and himself while living in Kentucky. In his sermons, the prophet had joked about the unbelievers who could not see or believe the things that we knew and believed. They need some coon grease to open their eyes, he said. In some of our homes, we had black and white photographs, paintings, carvings, and even embroideries of the prophet's log cabin in Kentucky. I often thought how the prophet must have loved growing up in those hills far away from civilization. The houses in Jeffersonville, Indiana would have seemed much different than the humble little shack in Kentucky, as it was called. When we thought about Jeffersonville, we thought about the tabernacle. We never thought about it being the big city of William Branham's childhood. Most of us had never seen the photos of historical Jeffersonville, and those of us who did never pictured William Branham in them. When the prophet spoke of his childhood, the scenes he described painted pictures in our minds much like the photos of the log cabin in Kentucky. Clear and free for as far as the eye could see. Looking at the historical photographs, however, I realized that Jeffersonville was not a barren wilderness. It was filled with industry and entertainment. Streets were filled with automobiles, rivers with steamboats. Towering buildings lined the busy streets as people scurried down the sidewalks about their daily lives. Bicycles wove in and out of traffic, careful not to run into the people crossing the streets to the local businesses, bars, and casinos. Familiar as we were with his stories of backwoods life, never for a minute would we have envisioned the young prophet in a bustling casino town. We associated the photos of his cabin that the prophet gave us to his childhood, just as he intended. We made paintings of the cabin, sang songs about it, and listened to stories about it in many, many sermons. Our children made wood crafts of the cabin. Some of us took trips to its location in Burksville, Kentucky, near the Cumberland River. We never knew that the prophet's cabin was used as a prop, or that in 1948, the prophet said that his cabin sat beneath a housing project. We were never aware that the Branham family moved to Indiana before his third birthday. The images of the growing metropolis on Spring Street in Jeffersonville are not what we associated with William Branham's childhood. We gave our children coloring books, told them stories, and even acted out plays describing the prophet's adolescent and teenage years in the wilderness, far away from civilization. As important as the city of Jeffersonville was to the message, it's hard to believe that most of us never studied its history. For many who lived outside of the state of Indiana and abroad, it would have been difficult to study, especially before the internet. Those who lived in Jeffersonville and in the surrounding area, however, have for years had access to a wealth of historical knowledge through the local libraries and the government facilities.
If this place were chosen by God, why did He choose it? Looking back, I'm surprised that more people were not curious. Jeffersonville, Indiana has a fascinating history. Jeffersonville was the first underground railroad route crossing the Ohio River. It was a strategic hub for the Union Army during the Civil War. The railroad bridge enabled the Union Army to send supplies to troops in the South. Jeffersonville was the home to Port Fulton and the Howard Shipyards, which employed thousands of people in Jeffersonville and in the surrounding area. It was the largest inland shipbuilding site in America from the years 1934 to 1942. Ed Howard, son of Howard Shipyard's owner, James Howard, owned the oldest Haynes automobile in the United States. The Quartermaster Depot served as a storage facility for Union supplies. During World War II, it was used to house German prisoners of war. So many were held there, in fact, that they were given jobs that Jeffersonvillians wanted. It was later occupied by the Prophet's sons for distributing the message and used to grow a multi-million dollar publishing company called Voice of God Recordings. Named for a quote by William Branham, I am God's voice to you. Jeffersonville was home to the Indiana State Prison. It was also home to illicit gambling casinos. Though it seems like such a quiet town today, this was not always the case. At one time, the city was booming with activity. The monkeys were a big attraction at the Greyhound races, bringing crowds of people from multiple states to watch the monkeys riding on the backs of the dogs as miniature jockeys. The city's liquor and gambling attracted famous mob bosses. The criminal activity in the city was such a problem that it was frequently discussed in city council meetings. City officials feared that Jeffersonville streets would become just as dangerous as Chicago and Jeffersonville became nicknamed Little Las Vegas. When you look at Jeffersonville, Indiana today, it is a quiet, peaceful town. It's hard to picture it as a city that attracted visitors from all across the country in the early 1900s. Jeff Boat, formerly Howard Shipyards, which once provided thousands of jobs, is no longer in business. When compared to the other side of the river, Jeffersonville has always seemed insignificant. When I was in the message, I used to wonder what brought the Branham family to Jeffersonville. Most message believers knew William Branham and his nuclear family, but very few knew William Branham's extended family. William Branham's siblings never spent much time with the message. I also wondered why message believers in Jeffersonville had been told that all historical records were destroyed during the 1937 flood. I was surprised when a message brother and sister told me that they had found that most records had survived. I wondered if the Jeffersonville Library held any clues to the Branham family migration from Kentucky. They said that some of the records were stored in the Indiana room of the Jeffersonville Public Library. When I got there, I was overwhelmed by the amount of information stored in one single room. Practically every aspect of Indiana history was contained in books on the shelves. And if the shelves didn't have something, it could easily be ordered. I was most interested in the local newspaper archives. Before modern social media, newspapers printed stories about all social events, big and small. From locals leaving town to visit relatives to new families arriving, the newspapers would tell it all. Large cabinets with rows of long, thin drawers held hundreds, thousands of boxes containing rolls of microfish. Each drawer held several years' worth of newspapers, all labeled in chronological order dating back to the 1800s. For as long as newspapers had been printed, they had been captured in the tiny little images of the microfish rolls, like snapshots in time capturing each day of Jeffersonville history. It took me a while to remember how to use a microfish projector. I hadn't had to use one since my school days, and even then I'm certain that a teacher or a librarian had loaded the reel into the machine. 
In the age of computers and technology, this was a skill that had gotten just a little rusty. The friendly staff at the library helped me though, and I was on my way. Getting the projector working, however, was the easy part. There were literally hundreds of thousands of newspaper articles, and using this older technology, they cannot be indexed or searched. Unlike a computer query in an internet browser, each reel must be loaded, viewed, and actually read in order to find a result for any search. It was a painstaking process, especially since I didn't know what I was looking for. One thing was for certain, I became a familiar face at the library. During lunch, after work, sometimes before work, I scanned through article after article, issue after issue. The first thing I was curious about was the actual loss of records, if any, because of the 1937 flood. Since we had been told that all newspapers confirming the prophet's stories were destroyed in flood waters, and since I now stood before drawers dating back to the 1800s, I wanted to know what was missing. I was certain that the water would have had some impact, especially for any archives that were stored on the first floors of buildings. To my surprise, not a single issue was missing. The newspaper appeared to have shut down for a brief period when the flood hit, but reporters were on the scene covering the disaster and printing it as the disaster unfolded. Once I had completely reversed the claim that records were destroyed, I knew I had my work cut out for me. As I scrolled through the pages on film, scanning each and every article on each and every page, I realized that the newspapers could hold the keys to unlocking an insight into the prophet's life that most of us had never seen or even heard about. I was surprised that other local message believers hadn't found this treasure trove. Using genealogy tools, other researchers had created William Branham's family tree. I was also surprised that the tree didn't have very many branches. William Branham's father Charles was the son of George Branham and Mary Shaw. In 1910, nine years before William Branham's grandfather died, there was an announcement in the Jeffersonville Evening News. Benjamin Lockard and George Branham moved to Jeffersonville from Cumberland, Kentucky. Could this be William Branham's grandfather, Charles Branham's father? Sometime between 1909 and 1913, Charles and Ella Branham moved to Indiana. Melvin, Edgar, Jesse, and Charles Jr. were all born in Indiana starting at 1913. Only William and Edward, Humpy, would have been in the Kentucky cabin according to the United States Census. There were other interesting facts found in the archives. From 1898 to 1902, Thomas Rader was the mayor of Jeffersonville. Rader was a name that I was familiar with. Paul Rader was a famous radio minister and second president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance who wrote the hit song Elvis Presley sang, Only Believe. It was a song that we sang often in the message churches. The prophet used it for his theme song. Mayor Rader's son, Ralph Rader, was a minister involved with the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, and no doubt would have used this song in his Jeffersonville church. Paul Rader was a relative. The Branham family was not religious, according to William Branham. They would have not been interested in the Raiders or other ministers. If anything, they would have been more interested in Ralph Rader's gambling. In 1900, Mayor Rader's son Ralph Rader was shot. 16-year-old Ralph went to make sure that Charlie Fogarty was brutally beaten. Fogarty pulled out a 38 pistol and shot Rader in the back. Ralph survived, however, and after traveling west, he returned to Jeffersonville to set up his tabernacle. About the time William Branham was ordained as a minister by Roy E. Davis and started preaching. There were so many distractions, so many curious bits and pieces of information that could be found in the archives. It was like a puzzle with a thousand tiny pieces all scattered out on the table. Still, I was curious to find what brought the Branhams to Jeffersonville. What about Jeffersonville made the Branhams leave their family in Kentucky?
In the early 1900s, after the Big Four Bridge was built, new factories were opened. A considerably larger force of skilled workmen would be needed. A transportation system was developed for workers. An interurban trolley ran from Louisville to Charlestown and Jeffersonville, opening the door to many, many places for men and women in the surrounding area to find work. Systems of interurban trolleys carried workers into other cities, like something out of the movies of old New York City. They could be seen carrying passengers all around the metro area and cross the Ohio River using the Big Four Bridge. The city of Jeffersonville Ferry was another option. Workers could board the ferry at the foot of Spring Street in Jeffersonville and cross over to Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville was filled with opportunity. Though we may never know for sure what brought the Branhams to Jeffersonville, one single name from one single article looked as though it might provide the answer. In the message, we often heard about how William Branham's father, Charles Branham, was a driver for Otto H. Wathen. The prophet described Wathen as a multi-millionaire. I found an article describing Charles Branham's arrest, and Otto Wathen posted bail. The thought suddenly struck me. Why was a multi-millionaire posting bail money for Charles Branham? I knew the answer might be found in researching Indiana saloon history. A battle had been brewing long before George Branham arrived. It was a battle that employed Charles Branham and gave the family living quarters. Otto H. Wathen was Indiana's anti-saloon league public enemy number one.